I have a heritage in the word of God and that it was given to me by my parents. So that was quite a neat moment as that uh, guy was sharing about that. But I really am excited about what I want to share this morning. And uh, as I said in the first service, this is me excited, okay? This is me excited. I might not look excited, but inside I'm jumping up and down with excited. Excitement. So there you go. This is me excited. Get it. Fantastic. Um, you know, when I look back over the 21 years that I was the lead pastor here, I can see three particular things that we introduced into the life of the church that had a serious impact on the spiritual temperature in this house. And one of them was reading and journaling and praying. But I want to be real clear what I'm talking about because sometimes I think we've got our own concepts of what we mean by reading and journaling and praying. When I talk about reading, I'm talking about reading the Word. I'm talking about reading the Bible. I'm not talking about reading the latest David Baldassi novel or even the greatest hot off the press Christian book. You know, I see people running around from time to time saying, you know, you've got to read this book. And, and they're excited about a book, but they're not excited about the Word of God. They're not reading the Word of God and they're sort of modelling their life after some concepts and some learnings out of a book. Not wrong, but it's not the Bible. Uh, I'm not talking even about reading Pastor Chandler's coming book of poems. And I said in the first service, if you tell him that, I'll tell him you're lying. <laughs> I'll repent later. Okay? Now I'm talking about the Bible. I'm going to talk about journaling. I, I'm speaking about essentially meditation. You know, writing down what God is saying to you so that it sticks in your mind. When I talk about prayer, I'm talking, I'm talking about a conversation with God. I'm talking about a conversation <coughs> that He starts and you continue. God begins to speak to you from the book. You write it down. Doesn't it follow that you should then talk to Him about the things He's talking to you about? And that's uh, the bottom line. And I think that's important to understand. So, I want to kind of set this up by telling you about some key days in my life that was formed by the Word of God. And when I look back on my life, I can see that you know, my life at times meandered a bit. Uh, I kind of lost track a bit. But then the Word of God would speak to me. And I'd come back online, right in the centre of God's purpose. And uh, that's really the story of my life. So this is a bunch of stories about my life, but I want you to sort of really hear the purpose behind them, how God has led me over a lifetime. Day one, at 16, I was asked by my high school principal to kindly leave his school, which I happily did. But in all that bravado, I was really quite lost and I can remember being acutely aware <coughs> and concerned about where I was headed. I can remember thinking, <coughs> whatever is going to become of me. My godly mother, God bless her, gave me a verse to read from Jeremiah 29 and verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. And I remember reading those words and taking a hold of them and planting them in my spirit. Now, things didn't work out for me overnight. I still had some personal struggles to get through, to get, you know, online. But I never doubted from that moment on that God had his hand on me and that there was a purpose in my life. Day two, I received my call to vocational church work in 1966, sitting on the beacon on Mount Tamarine looking at the sunset. It was a dramatic moment for me. Uh, an incredible moment when God spoke to me and called me to vocational church work. And I was excited about it. I remember coming back uh, to my home church and talking about it and the deacons of the church asked me uh, to come into one of their deacons meetings and just share what had happened to me. I did that, but one of those men actually ridiculed me. 
told me I was far too young to be making these sorts of major decisions, he said. Anyway, he'd been watching me and knew what I'd been like. Uh, I left that meeting totally, completely discouraged, uh, feeling like, you know, this thing isn't worth it, I must have missed it. But a couple of days later, another man, another deacon, came to me, one who'd been silent in that meeting, came to me and he gave me a verse out of Timothy, 1 Timothy 4, verse 12. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. And I took a hold of it. And I was encouraged and I set about doing exactly that. And I'd like to say that to any young person here who has a sense of call. Don't let anybody shake you from that sense of call. And if you want to know what to do in the meantime while you wait for it to be realised, there it is. Look after your speech, your life. You, uh, make sure you exercise love, faith, and that you're pure. I took it to heart. And a couple of years later, I was accepted into the theological college. Uh, day three. I was conscripted into the army on the 23rd of April 1969. It was a pretty scary time, actually, because the Vietnam War was raging and young men like me were dying. I came home uh, a night or so before I actually was shipped out to begin my uh, training, just before I left home for the first time. And my good old mum was at work again because she placed the verse on the table just inside the uh, back door of our house. And when I came in, turned the light on. It was the first thing I saw. Deuteronomy 31 verse 6. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. I wish I had the time to tell you about the number of times when I really know that God kind of intervened in circumstance to preserve my life in those years. Day four. This was the day that I married the love of my life. Uh, she still is. Uh, Mandy and I got married on the 22nd of Feb in uh, uh, 1972. Um, oh, that was a slip. What are we having for lunch today? Uh, you know, that was a... a, a um, on that occasion, you know, God gave us what I believe has been our life verse. It was on our wedding day. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, that... Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you as well. All of our married life, we have tried to put God first. We've tried to bury our own desires. We've tried not to do our own thing. We've tried to do the thing that God has called us to do. Now, we haven't done it perfectly, that's for sure. But God must have given us some points for trying because... All of God's promises in that verse have been realised. We've lived a happy life. We've never wanted for anything. And, and today we just celebrate this season of life, serving God, serving God with our family. It's just been a great life. And I believe that life verse really took root in our spirits. Day five. This was around the time that Carl was born. And God gave me a section from Philemon, verses 3 through 80. I'm not going to read them now, but essentially Paul is speaking about how his son in the faith, Onesimus, uh, needed to go to the place that God wanted him to be, not where he, Paul, wanted him to be. Uh, it was about releasing him to the ministry that God was calling him to. Um, I remember reading this at the time and thinking, well, what's that all about? And I didn't really get it, so I just put it in the too hard basket file for future reference. When Carl was selected by the elders of the church to lead you as lead pastor, 36 years later, get that, 36 years later, Mandy and I you know, had several conversations with him. You know, this is a big decision. This is hard. They're going to be really tough times. You make sure that this is God speaking to you. And then I remember these verses. And it allowed us to release him to what God was calling him to do. And I finally understood what Philemon 8 through 13 was all about. 36 years. It was 
seeded in my spirit that took 36 years for me to really get it. Day six. <coughs> this was the day I was introduced to the charismatic renewal that was sweeping the world. And I was baptized with the Holy Spirit, but I was a little bit worried about some of the things I was seeing. You know, the extreme happiness and excitement of people. Uh, I saw uh, people with you know, this incredible release of joy, and I was just a bit worried that it was really only emotionalism, you know, that happy, happy thing. And then God spoke to me from 2 Corinthians 3 verse 17, where it says, Now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And I understood that, you know, with the infilling of the Holy Spirit comes a liberty and a joy that we should be able to express. And so I jumped into the pool with the rest of them and splashed around. And I'm still splashing around today. Day seven. I've been in theological college. I've been in the army for two years. I've been out of the army and worked in the workforce for three years. Then I've gone back into the army for another eight years and all the time it niggled at me that I had this call of God but no real sense of where that could be fulfilled. began to think that maybe I'd really missed it. Maybe somewhere along the line I've just got things uh, twisted up, haven't really heard from God at all. And at that very time, my brother-in-law rang me one day with a verse that he felt was prophetic and it was. Habakkuk 2 verse 3. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks in the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and not delay. The whole trust of that verse is when God is ready to move, he will move and nothing will stop it. And I took a hold of it. That sense of call rose up in me again. And it wasn't all that long after that that uh, my opportunity to serve came. And that's day eight. That was the 11th of April, 1980, the day that I started as a pastor on the team, the pastor of Canada. And, you know, you can imagine, I felt a little bit overwhelmed, coming straight out of the army, uh, hadn't been active in church leadership uh, in the sense of, you know, vocational uh, kind of work. And suddenly I'm in this great dynamic church with one of the most dynamic preachers in the world, and here's little old me. I thought, I'm not up to this. God spoke to me. Deuteronomy 30, verse 11. Now what I am commanding you today is not too difficult for you, or is it beyond beyond your reach? And you can imagine how encouraged I was by that verse at that particular time. Day 9. This was the day that I discovered the reality of the body of Christ. (coughs) You know, there's something really... um, you know, it's supernatural that takes place when we all get together. Uh, you know, when we come together corporately, uh, we bring with us the presence of God. There's a dynamic of the presence of God when we come together. It's a supernatural thing. Uh, you know, God is with us as individuals wherever we are. That's the truth. But when we come together in the body, something supernatural happens. And I've always been excited about the body of Christ, but my understanding of the body of Christ was my local church. And I was serving my heart out uh, in that local church. But I saw everything revolving around a church. Um, God spoke to me from Ephesians 2, 11 through 19. And these verses speak about us no longer being you know, Greek or Gentile. You know, that incredible, mysterious thing of bringing all people together into one people, a new people the people of God, the church of God. Uh, it speaks about uh, just one church being five citizens, members of God's household. Now all of this was taking place while I was in Shanghai in China in 1982. Many and I were together. Um, we were taken into a church <coughs> that had been locked up for many years. It, in fact, it had been used as a warehouse, as all churches were at that particular time. So here we are at the end of the Cultural Revolution, going into this church that had just been opened. And uh, the guy took us there, you know, quite, you know, quite, uh, you know, without a lot of enthusiasm at all. He said, well, there'll only be a couple of people there. And when we got into this church, it was packed. 
I mean, I could not describe how full it was. In fact, at one stage it was concerned that it, it had like a balcony that went around uh, the sides and the back of the building. And people were expressing concern about this balcony, you know, to hold this great weight of people that were up there. And we're in this building, and I remember them singing together an old hymn of the church, Blessed Assurance. Tears running down my face as they sang, and suddenly I thought it. I caught the body of Christ. I understood it was universal. But here's the big thing. It was on that day that my sense of world mission was born. And I understand that God's plan covered a whole earth. And there were people everywhere that needed to see Jesus. Day 10. This is the day that I began to understand what kind of a leader I needed to be to do what God was calling me to be. Now, God spoke to me uh, during a trip, a, a study tour, uh, that I was sent on by Pastor Trevor to the United States and England and France and Italy. And he spoke to me out of Acts chapter 11, verses 22 through 26. And those verses describe the kind of leadership that Barnabas gave to the church in uh, Antioch, apostolic leadership, but their leadership principles and one of them stood out in particular, and that is that a church leader needs to be a change agent. Now, I haven't got time to tell you the full story, but I saw things, experienced things on that trip that spoke to my heart, and I knew that from that time on, I was going to put my energy into changing things. So, so the value of change became deeply embedded in the culture of this church. That's why you people say from time to time, oh, changing things again. Well, that's how it all started. And uh, I tell you what, it's uh, still here and it's alive and well. Day 11. That's is, uh, when I arrived in Ipswich to leave the church. Uh, it was in April of 1989. It wasn't long after I arrived that one of the elders said to me, so what's our vision? And I went into a kind of blind panic because I had a sense of what we needed to do, but I wasn't really able to articulate it. So I spent a day out at Lake Wivenhoe and I said, I'm not leaving here till I get a word from you, Lord. And he gave me Acts 2, 42 through 47, which is really famous around here. I saw this picture of this amazing, exciting first century church making a difference. And that became the, the, the vision mantra of this church. And it continues today under the leadership of Carl. Day 12. This was an interesting day. We were in Oregon, USA. Nanny and I, we'd been to a church conference up in um, Portland, Oregon. But we went up there at a very difficult time, a hard time, and we were seriously considering coming back to resign the church. Uh, we felt we'd done what we needed to do. But really the problem was that, well, we just weren't handling some stuff that was going on in the church. Those of you who might uh, have been around in those days might remember 1993, 1994. It was our best years. Man and I went trekking along the Clackamas River, which is part of the old Oregon Trail. And our whole purpose in doing that was to hear from God. Uh, we were out in the wilderness and we thought, if God's going to speak to us, He'll speak to us there because nothing can distract us. So we're walking along this river and uh, I found a rock and I sent Mandy to a rock about 50 metres away. And the deal was we're going to sit on this rock until God speaks to us. I can't remember exactly how long it was, but it feels to me like it would have been an hour. And then God spoke to me. And he spoke to me uh, out of a verse in the Hebrews. Um, the picture that you see there is the exact moment when God spoke to me. I kind of looked up. And Mandy had the camera, so I just gave a kind of a weak way, but God was speaking to me at that exact moment. That picture sits on uh, my uh, mantle in my study as a constant reminder to me of the day I almost quit. But here's the verse. Hebrews 12 verse 3 Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You see, he was saying to me, you feel sorry for yourself? Just think about some of the stuff I went through. And I did. And I thought, you know what? It's not that bad after all. Maybe I can hang in a bit longer. 
and so we came back and I was so glad that we did. Day 13, uh, this is a day that I'm sure some of you will remember. Uh, it was the 31st of December, 1999. It was the day that the millennium was about to begin, the new millennium. You know, there was so much student learning at that time. I if you can remember it. You know, the Y2K bar and planes were going to fall out of the sky. Remember all that stuff? And, you know, we were worried that we were going to lose all our life savings because the computers were going to crash and we'd lose our bank numbers and all these kinds of things. I mean, people were really shaken. Well, a few hundred of us gathered here in this auditorium. It was an exciting night. I can remember the youth were away at their own kind of uh, end, uh, New Year's Eve party. And the youth of the church spontaneously decided they would come back and join with the rest of the church family and say, we were packed in here and we were singing and worshipping and dancing. I can remember dancing all over the auditorium singing, My Redeemer Lives. It was a great night, but while we were singing that song, God spoke to me. Psalm 125, verse 1. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken, but endures forever. Fourteen years later, we're still here. Not shaken. Still swinging. Day 14. This was the 28th of February, 2005. Now, I've still got the journal with this entry in it. Numbers 27, verses 15 and 16. It says, Moses said to the Lord, May the Lord, the God of the spirits of all mankind, appoint a man over this community to go out and come in before them, one who will lead them out and bring them in, so the Lord's people will not be like sheep without a shepherd. And I knew that God was speaking to me about beginning a succession plan. It was the beginning of that journey to find my successor. And the journey ended with the induction of Carl as lead pastor about five years later. On day 15, well, this was a day that uh, it actually happened, the day that uh, Carl was inducted as our lead pastor. And that evening, after the meetings were all over, I was having coffee on our deck at home with some friends. And I was musing over my years as uh, the leader of the church and everything that had happened. And uh, I was kind of asking the question, how, how could it have turned out like that? I'm, I'm so ordinary. Uh, my giftings are so ordinary. And yet God has built this great church. It's grown by hundreds. And it's got a great future. How could this be? And one of the friends sitting with me just looked at me and said, Psalm 119, 105. You heard it quoted a few minutes ago. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to your path. And I kind of got it in that moment. It was the first time in my whole life that I realised that scripture had led and shaped, given me direction, kept me safe throughout my whole life. I realised that I really was a man of the word, that I loved the word and that I digested the word, and that I allowed it to affect my life totally. It's my fondest hope and prayer that everybody in this room this morning will take this book, read it, digest it, and let it shape your life as it shaped my life and the life of thousands upon thousands, millions of Christians over the centuries. You know, I could have started life and continued on that journey of, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know if I've got a future. But the word saved me. I could have given up when I was discouraged from church work. But the word saved me. I could have done church work without a real clear vision. But the word saved me. I could have quit halfway through. But the word saved me. Can you see how important it is to love this book, to read this book, and to allow God to speak to you? You see, it shapes our lives. There's a time in the history of Israel 
in the book of the law was lost. And as a result, Israel was bent all out of shape. It was shaken. And this went on for quite a long period in their history. Now this is an important loss to them. Now the book of the law, the book of Moses, probably the first five books in particular, um, lost. This was how God spoke to them. They, that they would read this word and that was God speaking. But it's lost. That was the only record they had of it. And so they lost their way in this period of time. But then Scripture tells us that during the reign of Josiah, the young king of Israel, the young reformer who's sitting in the front seat getting all excited at the moment, he found the book. The book was found in some dark corner of the temple where it had been misplaced. And they found it and they were excited about it. And this is how Jeremiah records it. He says, when your words came, I ate them. They were my joy and my heart's delight. See, Jeremiah is saying I digested them, I assimilated them, I was obedient to them, I made them a part of me and they became my joy. And that's what all of us in leadership are on about this morning. That's why we're spending time on this kind of teaching. It's our hope, it's our prayer that you too will eat and enjoy and grow and be shaped and kept safe by the word of God. We're going to look at an AV in a minute and it's a practical, very practical demonstration of how to read the journal and pray. But before I do that, I just want to draw your attention to the Bible reading plan that we're using. Now, people have got all sorts of Bible reading plans. That's fine, but I really want to encourage you to use this one. This is the one we're using here in the church. It was designed by Wayne Kadira in uh, Honolulu. There's nothing special about it. It's not better than others, but it's the one that we're using. And this is why I'd like you to use it. It's because if we're all using it together then we've got something to share about when we meet. Now, I don't know how many times I've heard people say, why did you get out of Jeremiah this morning? And people will begin sharing. Why did you get out of the Psalms? Why did you get out of Mark? Uh, Why did you get out of Galatians this morning? And uh, this is a great moment because it brings unity, you see. It helps us in our fellowship. Now, there are tens of thousands of Christians in fact, I think, I'm not exaggerating to say there are many hundreds of thousands, possibly millions. I think knowing the number of churches is about 17,000 churches around the world using this. I think that would go, well, it's a lot of people. It represents a lot of people. Um, there, there are thousands of leaders uh, using this. I, I ring leaders, I email leaders in the state, nationally and overseas, and we often spontaneously share from our reading for the day. And it, it brings unity, brings us together. Um, just last week I was uh, talking with Wayne Gideon and we spontaneously shared our readings from that day. There's something really special about reading the same reading. So let me encourage you, you to do that. If you decide to continue doing what you're doing, fine. But that's my two cents worth on that. Uh, the other thing to say is that there's three levels in here. It's really important, you know, if you haven't been in the habit of reading, start with level one. It's simple. It's not as long as level two or level three, but just start with something that you can chew on. Now, don't overwhelm yourself. Level two is, is sort of halfway between, obviously, one and three. And level three, well, they're quite um, full readings, and if you read level three, you read the Bible once in a year, and the New Testament twice. That is one and a half times through the Bible. Now, watch this uh, AV, and uh, you'll just see how simple it is for us to read in journal and pray. I've been writing a place to do your reading in the journal is really important. Uh, during summer, I sit on our deck and look down our yard at the river. That really works for me during winter. I sit in my study, look through the window down the yard at the river. An environment that works for me 
is very important, and I suggest that that's probably much the same for all of us. The obvious items that you're going to need are a Bible, you're going to need a Bible reading plan, and you're going to need a journal, and of course, a pen. Without those items, you're not going to be able to do your daily devotions. Now, some of you might prefer to use in place of these things a computer or an iPad. You can see I'm using an iPad here just to keep me on track with what I'm saying, but there's so many great programs that include uh, the particular Bible reading plan that we use that I'd really recommend those of you who like technology and can work well with technology to continue to use it. So a computer, an iPad, even an iPhone will work. Um, I think that there are at least two other items, however, that are very important for a successful time of Bible reading and journaling. Uh, one of them is a cup of coffee, just because you can, and a notebook. Everybody knows that as soon as you sit down to do something like Bible reading or journaling or prayer, your mind starts to go crazy, you begin to think of all sorts of things, and when that happens, it's a huge distraction. So if you've got a notebook handy, well, you just pick up your pen, you write down your thoughts, you know, I've got to put the dog out later. It's there, it's locked in, you won't forget about it. So it's very important for you to uh, be able to keep the flow during your time. I've spoken to lots of people who ask me why I'm so big on writing it down. You know, the journaling aspect. People get it's important to read and it's important to play, pray, but why do we have to write it down? Well, the answer is pretty simple. You know, Eastern cultures understood what meditation was. Uh, meditation was fairly common to them. But we in the West, uh, well, we're pretty slow learners in this regard. Writing down what God is saying to you, writing down what you need to do because of what he's saying to you is essentially meditation. And so we're teaching ourselves to meditate and it uh, helps us as we get into our day then to sort of recall the things that God's been speaking to us about. Okay, so now we're ready to start. Who talks first? Do uh, you talk first or does God talk first? Now one proven way that's very successful around the world is is uh, using the acronym SOAP. SOAP stands for Scripture, Observation, Application and Prayer. So we read through the designated readings for the day until the verse you know, jumps out at you, gets your attention. Everybody knows what I'm talking about. You can be reading the Bible and something, one verse in particular, sort of, you know, it's like it's in neon lights. I believe that's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. It's not anything more spiritual than that. Uh, it gets our attention, and when you kind of focus on that verse, well then you begin uh, your journaling process. So you write down in your uh, journal, S, and the scripture. You know, the verse highlighted to me today is Deuteronomy 13 verse 4. It is the Lord your God you must follow, and him you must revere. Keep his commands and obey him, serve him, and hold fast to him. That's the verse that I believe the Holy Spirit really highlighted for me this morning. Now my next entry is over observation. I write down my observation from that verse. I write down what the Holy Spirit is saying to me about that verse. You know, what I can learn from that verse. Keeping it in the context of the rest of the section that I'm reading. Remember, it's you know, quite dangerous to pick out a verse without considering the um, context of that verse. You can sort of go down the side, drag down the tributary and really begin to uh, hear things that God's not even saying to you. And here's something I think is very important. You shouldn't be doing a Bible study. Why don't you understand what I'm saying when I make this kind of comment? See, a lot of folks, when they get their Bible, they open it up, and, and it turns more into a Bible study than what God is saying to them personally. Really important for you to write down what God is saying to you. Not what the verse means, uh, not what the context in the day was, and not how it fitted the culture of the day. Um, what is God saying to you? So that's your observation. 
Next comes a ramification. This is when you write down what you're going to do about what God has been saying to you again. See, this is the difference between a Bible study and a devotional time in the Word of God. Your time reading and journaling should be time when God speaks to you about your life and how to grow and how to become more like Jesus. So you write that down and uh, your journal should look like uh, this is what I'm going to do today. As a result of what the Holy Spirit has said to me, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. Then the final entry is under P for prayer. Now some of the people have a lot of trouble praying in a really meaningful way. Not many of us have uh, trouble with the list, but the problem with the list is you're doing all the talking, you're asking God for something. And I don't think that's really what prayer is. Prayer is a conversation with the living God. And when we kind of pray out of the list, well, we're doing all the talking. Frankly, I think that's a little bit rude because you know, God wants to speak to us. And be in a conversation with somebody who does all the talking and you don't get an opportunity to get a word in, I think God sometimes feels like that in the way that we pray. So if God is speaking to you about, for instance, uh, this is what he spoke to me about, he spoke to me this morning about hanging on for dear life. So if God's speaking to you about that, then surely that's what you should pray about. So my prayer for today goes like this. Let me read it to you. Lord Jesus, you've been speaking to me today about hanging on for dear life to you. And I see from your word that I can do that by being obedient to what your word says. My problem is there is a lot of independence in me and that doesn't really work well for me. I don't like being told what to do. So help me to see that this is not dictatorial or legalistic, but a way for you to show me love and grace and protection from soul-destroying activity. And then when I'm finished, I give my entry a title and I enter it in my index for easy reference. I call my entry today, Hanging On for Dear Life. So, that's just a very quick explanation of how to read, journal and pray. You need your Bible, you need your Bible reading plan, you need your journal, you need your pen, you need a notebook, don't forget the copy. You put all these things together and I believe you can have a very successful devotional time sometime through the day. And maybe the final thing to say is simply this, uh, I do my reading in the morning. That works best for me. I totally understand that that's not going to be the case for everybody. Some folk are going to be middle of the day people, especially young mums, uh, families. Uh, you're going to have to find the time of the day that works for you. Some people do it in the evening, even late at night, last thing before they go to bed. Whatever works for you. So you can see it's not rocket science, it's something that uh, is entirely manageable for anybody. And let me say again, uh, if you haven't been accustomed to doing this, well then begin easy, start with level one. And I should have said before that those reading plans are available outside in the um, Connect Central area. Reading, journaling and prayer is a strategic plan for a devotional life. It shaped my life and it can shape your life. I do not believe and I, I, I just am so certain of this as a fact. I do not believe it is possible for you to stay on track, have a successful life, fulfilling God's best for you, a life that keeps you safe unless you're reading, journaling and praying. I don't believe it's possible. Our resource centre has got a whole lot of stuff there to help you get started. And uh, can I just say, parents, we've got a children's life journal and only one verse in it, only one verse from the same set of readings, 
Uh, we have a Youth Life Journal with, uh, I think it's about level two. Um, and then we have the Life Journal First Steps, which uh, includes all of the readings. And the Life Journal Standard. I should say that Life Journal First Steps and Life Journal Standard are actually exactly the same in content. Uh, so uh, really think about uh, visiting the Resource Centre before you go. Uh, I just use an ordinary old diary. A 2013 diary works for me because each page of the day, uh, of the year, has uh, a whole page uh, along to it. You've got the date at the top, so it's easy reference. And so that's how I um, journal myself. I wonder if you realise that a personal devotional life, which includes the reading of the word, meditation, application of the word and prayer are actually daily ministrations of the 21st century priest. You see, as believers, we are all part of a royal priesthood. We are the priests of God in the 21st century. 1 Peter 2 verse 5 says, You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now we don't have time to tease this out really, but Peter's referring to the Old Testament priests who had daily ministrations that they had to uh, be involved in. And that involved the, uh, the daily sacrifices and uh, all sorts of activities that were part of the ritual of being able to... Uh, um, interface with God. But you know, we're New Testament priests. That middle wall of petition has been broken down. We read about that through the week. The veil in the temple that separated the people from the Holy of Holies where God's presence was was torn from the top to the bottom signifying that God took the initiative. We're able to speak direct to God. And he speaks to us direct through his word which is one of the reasons why this is a ministration of a 21st century priest. I want to encourage you to see yourselves this morning as men and women and young people with a new opportunity for intimacy with God. And Pastor Carl referenced uh, a reading through the week where God himself says, you know, my desire for them and their future generations is that they would have intimacy with me. So that all will go well with them. Do you want your life to go well? Well then we've got to be men and women who love his word, live in his word, receive his word, digest his word. Daily. You know, uh, somebody said to me, you know, is this legalistic? I, I, I feel like in some measure I... I kind of dealt with it, but let me make it real clear. You can miss a day, you can miss a couple of days, you can miss a week. And you're not going to get beat up over it. The deal here is that this is what we want to do. This is what we're, our goal is, to do as much time in the Word as possible so that that level of intimacy with Him uh, can be complete. Now our God is a good God. He's got only his best for us. But we've got to play our part. So often I hear folks say, well, my life is just so messed up, it's so complicated, and seriously, I'm going to tell you this, and you're going to take notice of it. When I sort of get into conversation and ask them, you know, so what did you sort of hear from God this morning? Oh, well, I didn't read this one. Oh, well, what about this one? Oh, well, you know, I didn't read that. We've got to take note of this, church. If we're not living in his word and developing that intimacy with him, you cannot expect all to go well for you. Simple as that. It's my arm. We've got so much going for us. Resources, technology, iPads, computers, iPhones, smartphones. You know, it's so possible. It's so easy. So this morning... Let's make a uh, 
as a teacher is tension with the teacher. So just lift the level of our intimacy with God. Begin afresh with Him. And to love this word. To devour this word. Now I've got some um, journals here and some reading plans. Not uh, the life journals, just empty books. And I'd like to give them to the first whatever number until I run out. To anybody who is making a stand today to begin to do this. I'd love to do that with you. And uh, then at the end we'll, we'll just pray for anybody who would just like some personal encouragement along this way. Father, we, we just want to remind ourselves that you're a good God, that you've got only our best in mind. But as it is with the Father and his children, we have to play our part. We have to fulfill certain responsibilities to get that best. And so I pray this morning that those of us who, even now, even as we pray, are pushing back in their spirit and say, well, I haven't got the time, or it's too hard, or it won't make a difference. Lord, that you would just break into their spirit right now. Speak to their heart and encourage them. Lord, all of us want to be better, be more like you. And we just believe that hearing your word on a daily basis will bring us into that place of intimacy. So we thank you this morning for your help through the power of your spirit. Amen. Amen. So, you know, if you'd like some prayer, uh, we'd really like to pray with you. Encourage you. Prayer of any nature. God bless you, everyone. Uh, take time for coffee. Visit the Resource Centre. Have a great week.